following session was recorded live in San Antonio, Texas for the 2003 Caller Lab Conference. This is tape number seven, Digital Music. It's Chris Jensen. I'm the moderator, and let me introduce the panelists. Uh, we have Dick Henschel, who is from Hilton Audio. All right, and Vic Cedar. All right, Vic is a programmer and caller. He's done a lot with digital music and he will be looking at uh, recording and manipulating sound on your computer. Finally, I'm Chris Jensen, and it's a little hard to see up there. We do, are using slides, uh, and for the benefit of the tape, the slides will be available at www.squares.com slash digital music 2003. That's all lowercase and all run together, no spaces. Okay, so... Digital music, you have a lot of decisions to make. How many of you are already using some kind of digital music? Mini discs, compact discs? Okay, how many of you are thinking about it, making a transfer and wondering what to do? All right, there are a lot of decisions involved. Should you go digital at all? I think yes, and I'll give you some reasons for that. If so, how? And that's what we're going to look at today. Um, how will you play your music at the dance? Do you need to convert your records? If so, how are you going to do that? And do you need a computer at the dance? Or, e or either at home or at the dance? Okay, so we're just going through this quickly here. Uh, what is digital music? Okay, for, for our purposes, practically speaking, what we're talking about is compact discs, mini discs, or MP3 file format. The MP3 is a um, compressed digital form. It's taking the full audio file, which is made up of ones and zeros, a representation of uh, music, and compressing it down to a smaller file size. Okay, um, and if you have questions about that, talk to us. I don't want to get into real technical details. There are a lot of technical details to it, but you can use it without knowing that. All right, why convert to digital? Um, a major reason is that more music is becoming available only as in a digital format. Okay, this is from uh, March 2001 through March 2002. The amount of music that was available as vinyl only was half. Okay, 49%. I was counting releases on the Hanhurst tape is how I did this. Um, and then a little tiny bit more than half was available as digital um, but less than half is digital only. Okay, here comes this year. Yep. Notice the amount of music available on vinyl is shrinking. Okay. Now, a lot of new releases are still released on vinyl. A lot of the digital releases are re-releases of tunes that are now out of print on vinyl. But still, if you're a new caller or you're getting into it and you want those old releases, the only way you're going to get them is on CD or as an MP3 file. Okay. So, other reasons to convert to digital. One is just con pure convenience. Here is a stack of records, okay? That's about 35 records there. And here comes the mini disc that all of those records fit on, okay? So, there's some serious reasons for, just in terms of sheer portability, for converting to digital. Also, longevity. Record producers may not like this, but if, uh, from our purposes, when you play digital music, it doesn't deteriorate. You're not wearing it out. You can play it forever. You can play it a million times, and it'll still sound the same. So that's another reason to go. All right, music control. Once you get it converted to ones and zeros, your computer can do anything you want to it, basically. You can add reverb if you wanted to. I use it to change pitch and change tempo. And so there's a lot of good reasons for having it on your computer so you can do that. You can also process your old scratched up deteriorated records and make them sound better. Um, and another reason is because you then have access to non-traditional square dance music. A lot of us are using records that were not made by square dance record producers that are music released for a general audience that we've adapted to use for square dancing and all of that comes in a dig digital format either as an mp3 hello and then we will have the lovely Vanna up there uh, the screen for the benefit of the tape the screen that we're using the jury rigged screen that we're using to display the slides just fell down you can see it without 
Okay, well, let me keep going while we fix this up. Because the hallmark of square dance callers is flexibility for any situation. Okay, the other reason is that you can actually make your own music. And there are callers out there who are using uh, their computer to make square dance music. And then you can play it at your dance. All right, so playing your digital music, you have some decisions to make. Um, do you want to use a CD player? And there are a lot of different CD players out there. Uh, you might take a look at some of the DJ models that they're selling at the vendor's booth. Um, there's a lot of control. You get pitch control. You get tempo control, all independent. And there are also some ways of setting up loop points, although that's a non-trivial thing to do. But you can certainly do that. You can also store hundreds of MP3s on a single CD or a lot of MP3s on a single CD. And more and more CD players are playing CDs that contain MP3s rather than full, full non-compressed audio, I mean full, yeah, non-compressed audio files. All right, mini disc. Uh, this is certainly how I got started in video, I mean in digital music, and there's a lot of reasons for using mini discs. I still like them a lot. Um, and I know that we'll get Dick to talk about using mini discs. Um, and then MP3 players, and this is an area that's just growing really rapidly. Uh, you can get very tiny solid state MP3 players that can hold um, maybe 20, 30, 100 MP3s, or you can go, did, go hard disk and get a 40 gigabyte hard drive in an MP3 player so you can have thousands and thousands of records recorded on your MP3 player and it's all right there. It's a small CD sized thing but you don't have to worry about external media at all. So you might also, uh, I'm thinking about as a backup carrying my, a Sony personal organizer that plays MP3s and then you can have that. And finally the laptop computer which is I think by far the most flexible option. You have, can have all your music there, you can manipulate it at the dance, you can keep playlists, you can be organized. So I really like laptop computers for playing my music. But the other things are all really viable options and I think MP3 players, in my opinion, are becoming more viable all the time. Okay, plus you always need your amplifier and your speakers and your microphone. Okay, the, the things that we're talking about today are not taking the place of the standard music amplification equipment that you need. Okay, finally, how are you going to make your decision as to what to use? Um, real important, ease of use. It's got to be easy for you to use or it won't work for you. And I'm talking ergonomics, I'm talking the size of the buttons, I'm talking the size of the print on the machine, how easy is it going to be for you to work with the machine at the dance? Okay. Um, how easy is it for you to get the tempo control that you're used to on a record player? I mean, you're used to sliding a switch. Well, how are you going to do that if you choose to do that on your digital playback? Um, how are you going to do the looping? Okay, that's something to th think about. You may choose not to loop. You may choose to record your music and make it longer so that you don't have to loop. And you can do all that with digital, but it's something you have to decide how you're going to do it. Okay, how are you going to display or deal with your singing call lyrics? Okay, or your notes on patter or any of that stuff. You have to think about how you're going to handle all of the paper. I mean, in the old days, we just had our records, right? And they had the record jacket and you could just pull it out and everything was right there. When you go digital, you have to start thinking about how to manage all of the stuff that comes with that. Okay, and working with other callers. Here what I was thinking about was, you know, in the old days, pre-digital, we just sort of rifled through their record box and decided what we could do together. Uh, now it's a little more complicated. There's some advantages. You have thousands of records to choose from. If the call, other caller wants to do something, the odds are that you have it. Um, but it also, that with given so many choices, it's harder to make that decision, and it might be hard for other callers just to see what you have available. Okay, other decision factors. How easy is it to convert your music? All right, um, you have a whole bunch of music on vinyl already. How are you going to convert it to whatever ever form you choose, whether it's CD, MP3, or mini disc? Um, what's the expense involved in doing this? You know, the equipment costs and time. Don't forget your time. Uh, do you need a computer? Okay, what if you don't have a computer at all? 
well, then how are you going to go, how are you going to work with your digital music? You can do it. It just becomes a little more ex complex. Uh, and do you like computers? And are you comfortable using a computer? This is all something to think about because there's a big learning curve if you start going right into recording your music on a computer. It's not easy. All right, it's fairly easy, but it's not totally trivial. And I'm saying it's fairly easy from the point of view of somebody who's very com comfortable with computers. I like them, and I enjoy using them, and I've used them for a number of years. Okay, flexibility. I'm talking about if you record your music on, an, on a CD or you have the full-strength, non-compressed file format for your records, you will be able to convert in the future to any format that comes along because the odds are that that, that that format will be able to take uncompressed music files and convert. So if MP3, they discover something better, you can convert your music to the better format. So that's something to think about also. Um, that, I think, is an advantage that CDs or full-strength audio files have over Minidisc. I think it's easier to do future conversions. Okay, and ease of backing up your stuff. Um, you know, things break. You got to have a backup of your music. You don't want to record it again once you've gone through all the work of digitizing your vinyl. And finally, I put down image because of the cool factor. Um, you know, what's cool? Randy Page, I don't know whether he's here, but he's using an iPod as an, as an MP3 player. An iPod is cool. Okay, it's just a, a, a cool looking device and it will impress people who come to the dance and they'll go, oh wow, all your music is on this little thing, he's waving it around up there. So that's a, that's, that particular model has a five gigabyte hard drive, but the same size thing you can get with a 20 gigabyte hard drive. Okay, very cool, for whatever that's worth. All right, let's look at some of these equipments and just some advantages and disadvantages. Compact disc players, um, they're fairly expensive. You can get DJ models that give you a lot of control. What's showing up there is a Gemini um, CD model, uh, CD player, I'm sorry, DJ model, CD player. Um, disadvantages, I think that the media is delicate. I think it can get scratched. I would rather have an MP3, uh, a mini disc, frankly. Um, but CD is certainly a way to go. Okay, making CDs. The easiest is to use a computer. Again, this is, comes into how comfortable are you with a computer. You record your music to your computer, which Vic will be talking about doing. Then you do whatever you want to do to it, and you burn a CD. Okay? There is another option. Audio CD recorders have come down in price. You can buy one for $199, and you can treat it just like a tape recorder, almost, and record your vinyl directly to CDs. So that's another way of going at the digital uh, revolution. Okay, mini disc. Um, a lot of us have used mini discs for years. I certainly started off with mini disc. I think it's a great format. Uh, I really like the small rugged discs. Um, I like the fact that it's editable. You can label the tracks. You can delete tracks. You can add tracks at any time. You can divide up your tracks to do uh, looping if you want. So there are a lot of advantages to mini disc. It's also um, can be recorded directly. You don't need a computer. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, the newer models, and I think I'm going to ask Dick to talk about that, uh, are not seamless looping. There's a gap when you go to loop, a little sound gap. Um, and also I find the interface a little less intuitive on the newer models. But again, you can label your tracks. The disadvantage is, um, well, tempo control is uh, a problem with all of these, a lot of these devices but you can add on tempo control to some of the portables. Uh, if you use a desk model or a, a rack model, you get tempo control for that. Okay, again, the most flexible method of making mini discs now is using a computer. That's a common theme through digitizing your music. It's the most flexible option. Record to a computer, manipulate it, and then output it to whatever device you want to take to the dance. Um, however, mini disc, it's really easy to record directly to them. Most of the little devices, the devices that I showed up uh, in the corner before, are both players and recorders, so it's easy to record. Um, easy to remove the noise, easy to divide into tracks. MP3 players, this is where you want to keep an eye on for the future, okay? Um, 
there's a new Nomad. What's showing up there is a Nomad MP3 player that is a 40 gigabyte disk in it. Uh, it has tempo control. It has apparently quite good software for finding your music. Um, and the advantages are you're not carrying around other disks. It's all right there. It has a large capacity. Um, you get your tempo control. Disadvantages, I think that there's a disadvantage in the, um, in the interface. You want to make sure that the interface makes it easy for you to set up playlists and find your music. Because if you have 4,000 records recorded on there, you don't want to have to scroll through a list of 4,000 records to find the one you want. So you want to check the interface on all these devices. Okay, making MP3s, again, a computer. That's the easiest way to do it. I'm mentioning another method because the Nomad 3, which um, is available now, is recordable. You can actually do line into it and record music. So that would be another option. I personally would worry about backing up, uh, doing it that way, because you have 40 gigabyte hard disk in there. You know, if it crashes, which hard disks always do, sooner or later, you don't want to lose all that music. So I would say, in general, for using an MP3 player, you want to have a computer. However, it is possible without one, but you want it. Laptop computer, boy, I think there are all kinds of advantages. You get the same large capacity as you do with an MP3 player. You no longer have to carry any paper because you can work out to show your lyrics and show your notes and software. Um, you can organize by using either the computer's filing system or by using some kind of a database on your computer. Um, everything is software controlled, which means both a lot of current flexibility plus unlimited future flexibility because it's all in the software. So all you have to do is get new software and it can do new stuff. Um, I currently use, uh, to play my music, I use software that I'm happy to talk with you about uh, later on. It's uh, a product that's available, but it is, uh, we're not supposed to mention products at Color Lab panels, which I can see why, So, um, but I'd talk about you later, but there's other software becoming available that will do similar things, so it's, you can keep an eye on it, see what's available, there's software from Japan now that's available online, and I can give you the URL for that if you're interested, unfortunately the controls are all in Japanese, so <laughs> you have to be willing to experiment. Okay, um, the disadvantage is it's complicated. Okay, there's a steep learning curve to using a computer unless you already use it for uh, doing sound. So, um, so take that into account. Don't buy a computer and expect to use it at your dance tomorrow. <laughs> okay. All right, finally, um, preparation. The software that you need, you need software to do your audio capture. You need software to do editing. You need software to convert from MP3, I'm sorry, from the, your full audio files to MP3. Um, a lot of... You get a similar software. Vic is going to be talking about software called Cool Edit that does the um, recording, the capturing, and the editing, and the MP3 conversion, although it doesn't do CD, CD conversion. Um, for the dance, you need software to play your MP3s, and these are some of the considerations in looking at that software. Um, and you need software to show your lyrics, possibly. So that's something to think about. Since I talked to you last year, there have been changes, improved technology, better MP3 players, I would say that's the biggest change, um, better computer software, and lower prices on MP3 players, audio CD recorders, and laptops. As in most digital technology, the prices go down, the quality goes up. Okay, so far, that may change in the future. Um, some other issues to keep in mind, you want to do backup. There's just no question about that. You've got to figure out how to do that. So when you're using a computer, you really want to have a CD burner to back up your files. I back up all my WAV files to audio CDs. Actually, I burn them as audio. And then I can just grab one if I ever needed to and play it if I wanted to, as well as having the MP3s on my laptop. Um, finally, I really can't leave without saying something about piracy. Once you have your music in a digital format, it's just a computer file. You know, I could email you an MP3 that would be an exact representation of the MP3 that I have on my computer. And unlike most, unlike vinyl, I can keep it and give it to you. Well, just because you can doesn't mean you should. And just don't. Because you're cutting your own throat. If the music producers aren't making money by making new music, they aren't going to do that. And we won't have new music available. 
So digitize all you want, but keep it for yourself. Okay? Now, that's an overview, and I hope I've given you a lot to think about in terms of the decisions that you need to make in going digital. However, now it's time for details. Dick Henschel is the owner of Hilton Audio. He's been using mini discs for years. Um, he uses other equipment. Uh, he's, been, he's tried CD players and he's tried MP3 players. And he's going to talk about one of the most important things, which is using your Hilton amplifier to both record your music and play it back. And then he can give his experiences in using the equipment. Next up after Dick, we have Vic Cedar and he's going to talk about using a laptop to record your music and manipulate your music. And Dick will be down here working online. We're trying to do the uh, visual thing, and Dick will be up there. If you, if you have any questions for me, why don't we do that now briefly? Yes? We need the mic. Are you going to have any handouts? I see you have them. Yes, we have three handouts. There's one for me, which is a rehash of last year's with some additions, and that will all, that's also online. All of these handouts will be online. Dick has a handout that's really useful that contains uh, information. Well, all of the handouts are useful. Dick's handouts contains connection information for all of the models of Hilton um, amplifiers, and that's important to connect whatever devices you have into your amplifier to play them. And uh, Vic has a handout on using cool edit to record your, your vinyl records and that's something that you need to do and that's really important so they're all here can we have the url again for the uh, digital music that you showed right at the first yes that was that that has the the um slides that i showed plus my handout and that's www.squares with a z on the end of it Dot com. So that's S Q U A R E Z dot com slash digital music two thousand and three two zero zero three. Okay. We had a uh, clinic a couple of months ago about BMI ASCAP, and uh, it was a lawyer who is uh, teaching this type of course at CU in in Boulder, Colorado. And he was saying that any time we record anything, re-record, and use it for profit, such as we are doing, it's illegal. I think that uh, it has been generally agreed, and I can't say I'm not a lawyer because I am, but I have to say that I have not researched this. Um, and I, I believe that there is an issue there, but I believe that that because we are doing it for backup purposes that we are not yes we are making a copy to use but we're just changing media and I think it could be argued and I would have no objection to arguing that um, that what we're doing is a fair use um, we are even though it's not home use it's a fair use and I believe that DJs run into the same thing because they buy music and they want to record it onto CDs or mini discs for their usage as a DJ. And I've done some online research to see what they're doing and they have decided that that's okay to do that. Now, um, that certainly would be an issue and the record companies, I suppose, could come after us, but... Um, I would I would argue and could probably find a lawyer to argue that it's a fair use. So if you want to be super careful, who are you going to pay? No, it wouldn't be. It would be a Fox Mechanical. And, um, Tom? Yeah. Uh, that's definitely not BMI and ASCAP. Tom Dillner from Kentucky. Uh, there's been a lot of general discussions with this. Uh, with Harry Fox, there is an understanding that if you own and purchased a copy, you are allowed to make a copy for your use. They know we're using it out in the public. They know we're using it for square dancing, round dancing, clogging, what have you. That has been a generally accepted process that we are allowed to do. Now, there's no fine print in writing in any of our contracts, but they know what we're doing. 
They understand what we're doing and they have accepted that. But it has nothing to do with BMI and ASCAP. That's performance. We're strictly talking about mechanics and that's Harry Fox. Thank you, Tom. Let's get on to Dick. Dick Henschel. Okie dokie. Uh, Dick Henschel. Um, thank you, Tom, for that because I appreciated that. I was going to kind of say the same thing, but I think coming from you, since you're uh, much more involved with the actual music reproduction, is a uh, a good point. Um, my point has got not to start off with has nothing to do with the legal aspects, but just from a purely, uh, I think every one of us as callers uh, want to have as many records and songs to choose from as we can. And the only way we can ensure that is the, the people that produce our music need to be supported. And that means that whether you, no matter what are the formats that we're talking about, no matter which one you use, you... I would hope, personally, I know I do it myself, every piece of music I have ever used is a piece of music that I purchased, and I hope every one of you in here can say the exact same thing, and if not, you need to look in the mirror a little bit, because it, it, it hurts every one of us. For any one of you, you think, well, it's not going to hurt if I, if I copy somebody else's. Yes, it does, because it goes back to the person that produced the music originally. Uh, this is very, very important. Yeah, we have a fair number of new songs come out every month. Uh, any of you that take any of the note services, I mean, the um, uh, like the tape services, right, uh, are aware. And I want to see those same numbers or more of them coming out in the future because I want to have a good choice. And the only way we're going to have choice is if we support those those uh, producers. Now I'll get off the uh, bandwagon and kind of go on from there. Uh, the handout that I have, when we talked about what I could do to be helpful on this. Um, my handout, the last two pages of the handout is broken down. One of them says recommended hookups for recording to a Hilton, and the other one is recommended playback hookups for a Hilton. We get calls all the time for this. Obviously, for somebody getting started on uh, getting into digital music, you have to decide, well, how do I get the, my music from this record onto whichever format I'm going to, whether it's a mini disc or or into your computer. Um, I think this. I think you'll find this very helpful. Um, and I will be putting this up online as a um, uh, a future on the Hilton Audio website, which is hiltonaudio.com, www.hiltonaudio.com. So uh, if anybody needs any reference, or in, any of you, when you go back to your own callers associations, if there's any questions of how do I hook up my Hilton, just tell them to get on our website and we will have that information there for you. Um, the, the newer systems are fairly self-explanatory. I think anybody that has a, a newer system they bought in the last few years, they do have adjustable line outputs which can be adjusted to match into your computer or your mini disc, no problem. The older systems is where most of the questions come up. Um, particularly the older 300s, as a, a lot of you are aware, I'm sure a lot of you probably are still using some of the old 300s. We built the Hilton AC300s in four different models between the mid-70s up through early 90s, I guess it was, when we made the last 300, uh, 300C. Th those models were designed in an era where nobody in their wildest imagination, I don't think, could have thought about... Uh, <laughs> using computers as your as your music source at a square dance. We might have thought about, well, tapes, yeah, but that's kind of awkward. So recording from them can be a little bit awkward. Um, uh, in the handout, there is um, it, it there is a recommendation on how we recommend doing it. The only real good output on, for those of you that have an AC300, pretty much you have to come off of the speaker jack and we recommend very, very, very strongly isolating the signal. We have an isolation cord. If you want, I can tell you how to make your own isolation cord. The main thing is to be able to get that signal out of there with, while protecting your, your older set. So uh, anybody that wants that information, just tell me or get in touch with Elton Audio, and we'll tell you how to make your own cord, or you can buy the cord we make for $19. So, But uh, that's kind of the key there. Uh, moving on, I want to... 
as we get into question and answers, if you have specific questions on your system, please ask. I think I, I have always found on any type of meeting like this, you get a lot better information from the questions coming from you folks up to us. I just wanted to go over quickly the new mini-disc players Chris mentioned. Mini-disc players have gone through um, quite an evolution here lately. To um, The capabilities of the newer ones are, are pretty awesome because what they've done is They've taken the, for those of you like myself and used in many distance, they came out, they were pretty much a standalone device that uh, you, you almost thought of it as a, uh, an upgraded cassette player early on. Uh, you, you hooked it up to your sound system, you recorded your music, and you had it in a great format. Uh, nowadays, they have all that capability. They have the line inputs for recording, but they also have the ability to take MP3 files if you have MP3 files on your computer, they come, the newer models come with a USB cable so you can connect them into your computer, download your MP3 files directly on. The big advantage there, of course, is you can get a lot more on, and that's a lot of what we're talking about. Uh, digital music, you know, Chris went over the advantages of it. Uh, the evolution of mini disc is more and more on each disc. I mean, I, the, the original ones could only record in stereo. You got... Uh, I know when I first started using many of this, my first ones, I got typically about 20, 24, 25 songs, something like that on. Uh, nowadays, with the if you if you want to put it in your computer, convert it to MP3, download it, you can get up to four or five hours worth of music on a on a mini disc. That's a lot of music on one disc. So that capability is there. Yet they'll still play your older disc. So that's that's a big change. Um, be happy to go over any questions on them that anybody has. Uh, the second page of my handout just talks a little bit about the other things, pretty much what uh, what Chris was already talking about. Uh, uh, there are standalone CD recorders. Um, I I mentioned brands, which I probably shouldn't have, right, Chris? Now that uh, <laughs> I mentioned the ones I'm familiar with, so. Uh, that's. Uh, I apologize, apologize if I broke any of Color Lab's rules on that. I was just thinking more in terms of the ones I was familiar with. Uh, there are other standalone CD recorders, obviously. Uh, for for people who don't really, uh, if you really don't want to get into doing a lot on your computer, but you do want to switch over to using CDs, there are ways of doing that with standalone CD recorders. The main thing is just being aware that that is a capability. Um, CD players. The um, uh, the three main companies in that, uh, and I'm sure others, uh, uh, Palomino, Supreme, and ourselves, Hilton Audio, have various uh, CD players that have uh, variable speed and functions that you need. And there will be newer models coming out all the time. That's a uh, continually changing. One of the big changes that's happening with CDs uh, players, and, and Chris mentioned that. I, my prediction would be within a year or so, almost every CD player that comes out will be able to play MP3 format. I would be very surprised if you're going to be able to even find one in a year or so that doesn't play MP3 format CDs. So that's just one more reason to have that uh, uh, on your computer. And uh, once you have it in that MP3 format, however you got it there, um, the new CD players will be able to do that. I personally, from a personal usage point of view, I have my music also on CDs. I don't like using CDs as much. I mean, it's, it sits down to personal preference. I prefer many discs to the CDs. Uh, you got to be a little bit more careful with handling CDs. If you get smudges on them, they will skip. You don't have to worry about that. You can throw many discs around. That's personal preference. Um, and then the other thing is, the other thing that I think that's going to be changing very rapidly will be the MP3 players and the, with the hard drives in them, because that's going to be a continuing increase in capability, um, like the one that Randy Page has with the uh, the iPods, but there, there's other brands out there like the Nomads and the Jukebox and various models of those, and that's going to be a very rapidly evolving and uh, increasing capability and lowering price. They're, they're at a stage where they're kind of like with the computers. They're going to have more capabilities at a lower price as we go along, and that's a, that's a format that I think a lot of people should be looking at for long term. Uh, I think it's a very useful format. Uh, that's the main things I had uh, to say. I'm mainly interested if uh, people will have questions. I don't know if Chris wants to do that now or... Okay. Yeah, let's do questions specifically about um, 
connecting to the hardware and usage of the hardware since I think Dick probably has the most experience of any of us in using different types of players at a dance. No questions? I, I have more of a comment than a question. What sure, I found yeah. in the mini disc world, and you know, I use mini discs a lot, is that sometimes you'll get a mini disc from someone who's recorded it that won't play on all the other mini discs. Um, due, due to formats, due to you've recorded in mono and, and different brands out there. So that's just something to think about. You know, yeah. if, you, if you carry a mini disc, it may not play on every recorder. That's true. True. It's pretty rare, but it, it can happen. I, the, there are several brands of mini disc players, but Sony is the overwhelming one. It's uh, you have to look hard for the other ones, um, the Iwas and those. What kind of booster are you talking about for the AC300 on the uh, uh, the playback? Uh, the only one that we have. <laughs> we have a, a mono version and a, and a stereo version of a booster. You can. There are other ways of doing it. Um, the the key thing is. The inputs on the older Hiltons that are looking for a lot stronger signal than what a, a typical line level output signal is, so you have to boost it in some way. There, there's more than one way to do it. Um, when we first came up with the problem, when everybody was starting to switch to mini disc, uh, and, and it also applies to a lot of the CD players and, and even laptops, sometimes if you're using an older Hilton, you have to bump that signal up a, about a, a factor of two to three times. and uh, we make a little signal booster for that, but there are other ways of doing it. Uh, it, it the main thing is that you need to be aware of it more than anything else. Uh, one of the things I wanted to do uh, mention also is um, once you switch over to using a different method, uh, if you're going to be using, instead of carrying records, when you go dances, make sure you have the proper patch cords to connect into the different systems. Um, I, I brought what I... I lent one cord to Vic, but <laughs> basically I carry two cords and one adapter myself, and I can hook into any Hilton built, okay, so very small little package, I keep it with, uh, with my mini disc player, uh, but if, when you make this change, there are things you have to think about, and one of them is, if, if you're using a CD player, you better make sure you can hook it into your buddy's system also, so just be aware of that, that it, it is part of the change over to uh, getting away from records. And just a comment about the mini disc, uh, you were talking earlier that some of them worked and some of them didn't. One of the things you have to be careful of in the new models, you can get five hours on that disc, that's because it's, it's being recorded at a different speed, that won't fit in the old style, it won't play in the old style right. disc. So if you've done all your work and you're trying to cram every second on every disc you got and then you go to somebody else's dance, there's a good chance it's not going to play on his player. So you might as well pack yours or whatever, but you have to be careful because in, in that particular format, it's not going to play. Okay, as, as Dick knows, uh, I do many discs. And, and, uh, your, I found name, it, and your name, Bruce? Oh, Bruce Mitchell. <laughs> Uh, and I found mini discs to be very, you know, I've been very happy with the mini discs, but I've also been looking at the uh, the hard disk concepts, uh, and particularly with MP3s. You alluded to the concept that maybe MP3 is not really here to stay uh, when you're dealing with mini discs, and I'm curious as to how you how you perceive that. Also. Um, I use a, for a singer it's not a problem, you're just playing a record all the way through. But if you're going to do a loop factor uh, with mini discs, and I take great pains to fix, to make my loops seamless so that nobody hears the, the jump from one to the other, um, how will that, how will playing that in an MP3 format work? Um, how will it, uh, how will it come about? Uh, can you loop effectively using MP3 players? And so on. The one thing that Chris mentioned, and I, I just didn't mention it, was the newer models, one of the things, obviously every time they come up with a model, they change things. Some things you like, some things you don't like, they change. Um, one of the things that they changed on the newer models of Minidisc is when you have it in the single play repeat mode, once it gets past the, the anti-shock function time, whether that's 40 seconds or whatever it is, within that time, if you do a loop within that time, it's seamless. But once it gets past that uh, memory time, so it's going back longer than what the memory is, uh, you do have about 
you know, I've tried measuring it myself. It's about a one and a half to two second delay that the, the older models did not have. Comment, Tom, did you? Um, I wanted to uh, comment on the MP3 format. Um, we were getting into legal issues a little bit, and MP3 is a patented format or a patented compression method. All right, and so far the owners of that patent have not uh, charged for using that patent and for doing players that use that, that technology. Uh, they are starting to charge for conversion software, for software that converts from WAV files to MP3 files. There is a possibility that in the future they will start to charge for using that format. That's certainly their choice, their prerogative since they own the patent. There are formats that are becoming, that are being developed that are supposedly of equal or better quality to the MP3 compression algorithm that sound better and that are in the public domain. So what I'm thinking of is in the future it may be something that we may think about converting to and it will be easy if we have the WAV files to convert to another format. Um, the looping, um, I would say for MP3s, again it's going to be to a certain extent a software function and if they start doing MP3s for DJs, you can bet that there will be some kind of looping mechanism if DJs start to use it and that would be a development in the software in the mp3 players. For currently, what I would do probably if I were doing it would be to take two approaches. I would take Dick's approach uh, for mini discs. He will often just record with no intro and no closer and just put it on single track repeat. So you don't have to worry about marking tracks or anything. Yeah. I'm sorry, the question was with the MP3 also. Yes, you could do that. There, are, there is single track repeat on MP3 players. So that would be one approach. Another approach which other callers take is when you're doing your digital manipulation on your computer, you just make a longer record. You just, because you have 40 gigs, which is a lot of space, you can make a 10 minute patter record or patter tune just doing cutting and pasting of your sound file and making it so that you don't have to loop. Okay, yeah, um, one more, and then let's go to, to Vic. As I understand it, the uh, mini disc players don't have variable speed on it, that you need a separate device for that? Uh, yes and no. Uh, <laughs> there, there are models that have variable speed built onto it. Chris mentioned I have a home unit myself that has variable speed on it. Um, the uh, uh, there's a model that, that Tom has had, uh, the B100 is it Tom, that uh, Sony makes that has a variable speed on it. So they have had units with variable speed built onto them. Um, I guess it's okay to mention a product that we, <laughs> Hilton Audio makes a product that we, we modify the, the small mini disc players and build our own speed controller onto it. So, so is it possible to, to buy a device that will fit on a, on a mini disc that you already have, yes. a player? Yes, yeah, yeah okay. you can do that if you want, sure. Okay, let's uh, get started with doing the digital editing, which is one of the more complex things that you can do, but one of the more powerful things you can do. You can take a record and get rid of the scratches and change the pitch, which is something that I use a lot as a woman caller. Um, records are made for baritones, that's fair, because most callers are men. But from my point of view, I want to change the pitch. Well, I can do it all in software now. And Vic is going to show us using Cool Edit. Um, I'm Vic Cedar from California, and I will, I'm going to try to demonstrate a bunch of stuff on the computer for editing. Um, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start up the Cool Edit program. This is a program that's available on the internet. It's about $69. You can download a trial version, play with it for a while, and then decide to buy it. It's extremely powerful. It's got lots of different functionality. It's basically much more powerful than we would need. They also sell a, a professional version for about a two, $250 or so. So, let's see here. There. So this is the Cool Edit screen. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to record a little bit of music. So basically I've, I've got the correct chords hooked up, hopefully, and I've got the computer configured. And all I'm going to do here is from the menu, select File, 
new, because I'm going to create a new file. And then it wants to know uh, parameters for the file. And I'm just going to basically select the default, but select mono mode. And this is the 40, it's got a sample rate of 44, uh, 100 hertz, which is the standard sample rate for CDs. So I'm basically doing a CD style recording here. I'm going to click OK. And then I'm going to click the little play button or little record button here that's in red. And if you could put down the needle, we'll record a little bit of music. And you'll see at the bottom of the screen, there's a decibel meter. Once the, re once the recording starts, we get the music going down the bottom here. You don't see much on the screen yet. But let's, let's turn it off for a second. This is the music that's been recorded. And it's kind of a wave representation of the music. Okay, so we could go over here. This little uh, vertical bar is a time uh, cursor. We can, oops, yes, let's set this, uh, put this puppy in the in there. Okay, so I'm going to play back what I just recorded. Hopefully, it's just music without my voice. <laughs> And you can see the time bar moves along as we go through the music. Okay, so what we've got here is, I'm going to zoom in here to show you what the digital music looks like a bit. Basically, it looks kind of like, you can't really tell here, but if I keep zooming in, further and further and further, now we've got, we can see the little amplitude spikes going up and down. You'll notice there's some little dots in here. We zoom in a little bit further. Each one of those dots is one of the samples, rates that got sampled, all right? So and you can go in further as much as you want, all right? And you can keep going, but uh, so those, that, that's basically what you're doing. You've got the digital uh, positions there, and you can edit those. Um, zoom back out. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to load in a file. Let me close this one, get rid of it. I'm going to load in a a particularly bad file and then clean it up a bit. Okay, This is a file of a very old record I had hanging around called Jingle Jangle on the Sets and Order label. And so here's, here's a recording, a full recording of a three or four minute record. The first thing I'll typically do to this is I will do something called normalize it, which means I will take the the volume here is not Com not completely all the way max maxed out. So I'll normalize it, which means I'm going to maximize the volume. Um, and you want to do that. Oops, how do I do that? Transform amplitude normalize. My this is all the all the details are in my handouts. So I'm just going to go kind of quickly over so you get a general feeling of the things you want to do to your music. So I'm going to normalize the entire thing to 100%. Then it's going to take that and it's going to find the uh, largest peak and then normalize that to the full uh, screen height there. And here it goes. Another four seconds. So now it's basically increased the volume. And if you, if you do this to all your files when you load them in, they're all going to be the same volume. So you don't have to go and twiddle with the, the volume controls on your player computer or the Hilton each time you change a record, because they're all the same volume. So I'm going to play a little bit of this so we sound how, see how bad it sounds. You hear all that hit, that little cracking, popping, because it's a really old record. You can still hear the, the, the hissing and popping going on in the background. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to clean this up. This is called noise reduction. And what I'm going to do here first is I'm going to zoom in on a bit here on this area. And here's the start of the music right over here to your left. Yeah, those are all scratches and, and whatever else. So what I'm going to do is select part of that. Okay, so basically I've highlighted the scratchy area. Now I'm going to go over to uh, transform noise reduction, noise reduction. And I'm going to say get pro get the profile from the selection. What that's going to do is it's going to take those scratches and it's going to convert them into some pattern that is stored. So it knows the pattern of the scratches. It knows what, what frequency they are at, basically, and kind of how they look. Okay. Then once I've done that, 
I'm going to take, uh, in fact, let's zoom back out a bit here. Let me just take from right about, I'm going to select this region here, the first maybe, uh, what is that, 15 seconds. Okay? And then I'm going to do noise reduction on that. And I basically go into the same thing where I just was, where I got the profile, but I'm just going to click OK this time. And it's going to basically take that highlighted section in white and do noise reduction on it. Now, if you'll notice, the very left-hand side where the noise is, is now basically a flat line, which means it's removed all the noise from there. But also, the other part of the white region, it has reduced noise from the rest of the record. So if we go here, I'm going to start up, start playing from the beginning again. You notice there's no, no noise. We get into now the music. There's hardly any noise. In another couple seconds, you'll start hearing the hissing again. So there it goes. So we just, we just took out all that awful noise, okay? Now sometimes when you do noise reduction, things sound a little bit tinny or it might sound a little bit different. You can go and play with the parameters and the noise reduction a bit to try to clean that up, all right? Um, let's see. The next thing I would do is I'd do the... I would probably undo this and then do the noise reduction on the entire file, all right? And after I've done that, I would take this, this, this part here at the beginning and delete that because I wouldn't want that in the file because you, you don't want, you know, the five seconds of, of trailing, uh, beginning space and trailing space on your record. You just want the music recorded, all right? Um, oh, and when you're done with this, you would go up to File. Uh, save as, and it's got, the cool editor has plenty of different ways of saving the file. R the default right now is Windows PCM Wave, which is a wave file, and a wave file is basically the raw, uncompressed music, just like you'd get on a CD. And when you save, like this is a mono version of a like a four-minute record, you save that, and it's maybe like 20 megabytes. That's a lot of space. If you convert it down to MP3, which is what I'll do here. I can select MP3, save. Um, actually, get out of here because I have the whole thing highlighted. File. Save as. MP3. So it brings up an MP3 encoder option. I'm just going to select the default, which is still the CD quality, or almost CD quality. And then it's going to go off and save that data. And it takes a few seconds because it's, in, it's encoding the data right now. And basically, an MP3, what we do on that, or what the encoding algorithm is, is it takes, it takes the music and it looks to see what it can take out of that. So it's trying to compress, compress it to something small. So it throws away things that the human ear can't discern. It tries. It has a special algorithm to throw away, you know, notes that are like too, it's very close together, but they're like almost the same. Well, it'll throw one of them away. Or if it's got, it's got a very uh, loud, um, uh, a very loud uh, sound at, at one frequency and a very soft one at the other one. At the same time, it'll throw away the soft one. So it throws away stuff that you. It tries to throw away stuff that you can't hear. Okay. Now I'm going to load in a different file and show you. Um, how to change tempo, change pitch, and stuff like that. And this is this is really uh, this is really nice to do here. Okay, so this is Gallon Calico, Gallon Calico on TNT. So just play a little bit of it here. So it sounds like that. So the first thing I might want to do is uh, change the uh, what should we change first? I'll select a, a section of it again. This time I'll go up to Transform, and I'll select Time Pitch. I'll get in there, and let's do a, a time stretch, which is basically I'm going to change the tempo. And I'll change it to 10% slower. And it's going to take that initial section I highlighted, highlight it, and make it 10% slower. And so here it is. Oops. Let me rewind it. Start over. Rewind it. Play. So this is 10% slower than what it was before. And it'll change to 100% in a minute here. So now it's back to what it is. What it was. So you can.
can go and change the tempo if you don't like it. Um, and that, that one there preserved the pitch. You know, it's the exact same pitch. I'm going to just, not right now, I'm going to undo what I just did. So change it, it's all back to normal. Then I'm going to take the same selection here. And this time I'm going to change the pitch only. Oops, what am I doing in here? Transform, time, pitch, stretch. And there, there are, the cool edits like Microsoft Word. There's just millions of options and things to play with. And I don't profess to be an expert on this, but this is just what I, things I kind of do here. So I'm going to go to pitch here. And they've got a, uh, a little dialog box here that says transpose. I'm going to change the pitch of what we have three sharps flatter, or three sharps higher. Okay. And click OK. It'll change that same section again. Raising pitch. Click. And so here we go. Change pitch there. Go back to normal again. So that's pretty powerful. Go in and do all that stuff. Um, let's see. Oh, and also in Cool Edit, they have they have built-in filters. They have things that will reduce or boost the treble or the bass for you. And you could be over the entire file, or you can just select a section to play with. Um, there's things that can make it sound like different, uh, like old-time radio or or vinyl, or you can make it sound differently. Different things to play around with. Um, you can also do things like cut and paste sections. Perhaps you don't like the, at the beginning of the file, maybe there's a bunch of drums or a rooster crowing or, or you know, a telephone ringing or something that you don't want there. You can cut that out. Just grab it here, select it, hit the delete key, and it's gone. Or you can cut out a section here, copy it, paste it somewhere else. I mean, this is just really quick, but you have to go in and zoom in to find where you want to go to do all that stuff. Let me undo that. Now what, I'm, now what I think I'll show you next is how I use the music here. What did I just do? Save as. Are there any questions so far? The one question I have is, is some of us want, it, want to know what the beats per minute are, you know, because we always call either the 128 to 132. Is, is there a way in there to, like, tap a key so it'll tell you what the BPMs are? Um, I'm not sure if there is in Cool Edit, but in about two minutes I'm going to show you how I do the beats per minute. <laughs> um, um, I, there might be something in here. I'm not sure. There's a lot of stuff here. Um, and I don't have the latest version of Cool Edit also, so more questions? Just a comment. Uh, one thing I found, I use a little bit of Cool Edit. You certainly know a lot more about it than I do, but um, it, it apparently most of the music we purchase on vinyl is 132 beats. I think most of us will agree with that. Most of it is. And I like to call it about 124, and I just figured that out with a little calculator. That's 96%. And I found out I just couldn't where you just went and said, make it 90. I want it 96% of the original speed. And boy, I get 124 every time. It, it really works great. And so I just use a percentage figure. All right. Um, oh. What, what speed and uh, computer you need to do all of this to run oh. a cool edit? Um, basically, you can use any computer sold today. I mean, this, this the laptop I here, have here is a fairly powerful laptop, but I've, I've run cool edit on my old laptop, which is, was a 233 megahertz computer, uh, Windows 98. It worked just fine. Hard ditch. Hard ditch. Hard, yeah, whatever. Uh, capacity. 
Uh, the one here I have is a 32 gigabyte hard drive. The old computer I was just talking about was a 4.77 gigabyte hard drive. That computer was just fine for quite a long time. I mean, in, in fact, it stored over 1,700 MP3s for me before I started like running out of space. So basically, anything out there today should work fine. If you're in the if you're shopping for a computer, I have a few recommendations on my handout. Um, that basically says look for things that might say multimedia. Maybe they'll have a better sound card than a, a non-multimedia computer. Is there any uh, memory, uh, minimum memory restrictions or, or what you would recommend for memory, RAM? Um, once again, I think pretty much anything out there should work fine. Um, personally, I usually go for the high-end kind of computer with plenty of memory because, you know, I've, this is like, who knows, my eighth or ninth computer. And, you know, each computer, it's like you either run out of disk space first or not enough memory. It, it rarely seems to be speed, but I always go for, you know, the high-end Two real yes. quick questions. Tim Teal from Texas. Uh, one, if you've been like me and spent hundreds of hours and recorded hundreds of mini discs and now want to go to this, is there a real quick way to not have to play that record again and get my mini disc dropped onto the computer hard disk? Just I have one more, one more question. Too. Okay. Uh, personally, what I did is uh, my my. Um, my home type unit uh, mini disc player has an optical output and I put a, uh, a sound card in my computer that had an optical input and you can do a digital to digital directly into your computer that way second question uh, on the cool edit is there a Macintosh version for that Chris Uh, I use a Macintosh to do all my sound editing and stuff like that. I, cool Edit is not on the Macintosh, but there are other programs that do the similar things, just the same on a Macintosh. It's not a problem. You can talk to me, or it looks like Vic Carrier knows about using a Macintosh to do sound editing. So it's, the software is definitely available. What I do is I do all my sound recording and editing on a Macintosh, just because that's what I'm used to. And then I transfer the MP3 files over to a PC that I use for my calling because the software that I use only runs on a PC. I'm a little concerned about uh, about mixing formats. Now I understand that MiniDisc is a format that is similar to MP3, but it is not exactly MP3. Uh, do you have you experienced problems changing your MiniDisc format? digitally over into your computer and what format does it turn out to be in the computer and is there a price to pay for that as, as far as uh, uh, fidelity goes? Um, the, the, uh, the MD players have, there's a Sony proprietary uh, format called like A-Track and so basically that's similar to MP3 but it's not compressed as much. It's about compressed about half as much as an MP3. When you would take that and, can, and upload it to the computer, the computer would store it as a WAV file, okay? Because that's the raw, uncompressed thing. It does. Computers don't have the A track. They have basically they do all the audio in WAV file. All the edits are done in the WAV file format. Then when you save it, you can specify what format you want to put it in, okay? Since you've already compressed it going to the A track on your MD, when you take it back to the WAV file and then compress it using MP3. You're doing basically a compression of a compression, so you will lose some fidelity there. But it might not be noticeable. It's just the trial and error will tell you whether it will work. Okay, so you haven't noticed a big problem. All right, any more questions? Got a, maybe a little bit more to show you here. Um, no, no, that's okay. I was just curious, or I was just curious if anybody's had any. Um, I just got a new Macintosh. I've been using Macintosh for a few years, but I just got iTunes. Does anybody have any information on iTunes and how it would relate to square dancing to store your files, kind of like Vic's program, but using iTunes? Um, 
it depends on whether you can get plugins for iTunes that will allow you to do the. Again, it comes down to tempo control and pitch control is what I look for in an IT, in a software player. Um, you could certainly try iTunes and see if it will do what you want. It certainly would do the playlists and keep you organized That's and things like that. Okay. Um, so you could look at it and use it for that. Okay, so what I brought up here is um, a program I've written uh, to do music, and this is what I use for calling. Um, right now what I'm going to do is I'm going to load in those two MP3 files we just created, the Jingle Jangle and the ca Gal and Calico. Just loaded those in. They're up here at the top. There's Gal and Calico loaded in. This little window here that just popped up is the uh, music player that I use. This is the one I've written. And what it does is it's basically an interface that goes off to another music player. And this one can control cool, uh, excuse me, it can control Winamp version 2 point something or other. Can't control version 3 yet. And it also will control the Microsoft Media Player. Right now I've got it controlling Winamp. And I can click this button to bring up the Winamp uh, windows. And so here's the gallon calico, the one we just uh, recorded. And I have a little beats per minute calculator here. So basically I'll start playing the record, and then I, I hit a, a specified key, the K key, 16 times to calculate the beats per minute. So I'm going to start playing it and hit... Oops. Lost the... Uh, where'd it go? All right. There it is. So I'm just going to hit the K key 16 times. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Okay. So, obviously it was done on the one where <laughs> we had changed the pitch. Uh, but <laughs> not the tempo, which is good. And so what happened when that, that little dialog box just popped up that I closed... Um, that showed me the difference in milliseconds between each beat, and then it took, since I had 16 of them, I took an average and then calculated the beats per minute. So that came out to 127.4 beats per minute. Okay? So taking that, I can now play the record here, and I've got some controls here where I can change it and I'll speed it up a bit. And now it should be 136 beats per minute slow it down to 121. This is all done in real time using software. So so you don't have to necessarily do all your conversions in Cool Edit. You can do it on the fly in the software. Um, another thing I'll do once I load in the music is I will set some flags to it to tell it what kind of music it is. Like this was a... Uh, Patter. Maybe I use it, this record for patter, and I also use it for a singing call. And telling the program that it'll, when I bring up the music the next time, it'll ask me whether I want patter or singing call. If it's a patter, it can set the loops for me. So, for example, if I want to set the loops on this one, I would go to the loop tab and play the music. One. Maybe I'll set it there. And I'll take this, drag it over here, somewhere. Here we go. Five, six, seven, eight, one. Okay. So I've just set a loop there, and there's some little markers here on the timeline that show where the loop is. Then I can press this little button here that says Test Loop, and this will set the start time five minutes before the end loop and play through the loop and you can hear how it sounds. We'll do that. Five seconds before. And then that's where it looped. And that didn't sound that great. So what I could do is tweak this a little bit. Here I'm changing it by uh, 20 milliseconds and trying again. That's a little bit better. And the loops on the computer um, sometimes aren't as seamless as you'd like them to be because there's other processes going on in the background on the computer that sometimes grab the uh, 
the CPU time when it's trying to do the loop reset. There's a slight, maybe it might not set it right at the right spot again. Um, quickly, I will show you a little bit how I call here. Call from screen. That's fine. When I'm calling from the screen, I have I use the full screen basically here, and I've got some choreography displayed, and I have some lists of calls displayed, and for this particular one, I have some uh, little jingle things: uh, ducks and little pond, geese in the clover, hide the pretty girl because I'm coming over. Okay, so basically, you can have whatever you want here. You can have a list of the people to dance, or you know, just you can just bring up different windows of things. Um, I'm going to go in and select some music here. Um, which one do I want here? Now let's do this. You can filter. This is this is a list of music. I can filter by singing calls. So these are my favorite singing calls right here. Let's bring up Mac the Knife on Blue Ribbon. And when I bring it up, it automatically also brings up the cue sheet right here. And Debbie's recently added the lyrics for me, so I've got the entire lyrics of the original song. So you can set up your computer to bring up stuff, the lyrics and the cue sheet and all that stuff. And I've got it set up so you can do single keystrokes. I can hit P to start playing. It brings up the player. And now since, and now since it's a, a singing call right here, it's got the approximate area of the opener, the first two... Uh, sequences, the middle, the next two, and the closer. So you can kind of see where you are on the record here as the, the time scrolls around. And that's about, I think we're running out of time, so here's Chris. So any questions for Vic, by the way? Just real fast. Ron, Ron Counts, a uh, question about putting your lyrics and uh, typed material in, do you scan that or is that individual typing required? Um, you can do that many different ways. Um, certainly scanning it in is probably the worst way in, in, in terms of you scan it in as an image. If you scan it in with the uh, what's it, optical character recognition, you know, that's a little bit better. Um, I have Debbie, <laughs> my wife, type in all my lyrics and all my key sheets and uh, <laughs> or you can certainly, I believe some of the vendors they on the CDs or, or MP3s you get the cue sheet in a document format or something. Vic, on your website don't you also make available for free the lyrics that Debbie has already typed in? I guess I should plug my website. Uh, <laughs> It's uh, it's www.cedar c e d e r dot net, and we've got a lot of information on square dancing up there. And in particular, there's a uh, record database up there that basically has all the records that I own and a few others that other people have like submitted to me. And we've got the words and the label and and cross references off to the caller who recorded it and stuff like that. So it's, so you can get some some of the cue sheets from our website. Okay, let's have a hand for Vic Cedar and Dick Henschel. And I want to thank you all for coming, and good luck with all your bits and bites here.